I think the trademark cops are at the front door. Hey guys, it's Chris from Highline Guitars, and you're watching another episode of From the Luthier's Workbench. Uh, as you may be aware by now, uh, Gibson has been busy lately on the legal front, and they have filed a lawsuit against some guitar manufacturers, and then they posted a video, which they, they posted it, and then they, they rather quickly took it down which uh, featured their new director of, I don't know, brand experience. I think that's what he is, Mark Agnesi. And he was talking about how you need to play authentic and that if you are building or selling guitars that use any of the Gibson trademarks or patents, any of the designs that they own, they're gonna, they're gonna have their eye on you and they may come after you as they've done with uh, the other companies. I think they sued Dean and a couple of others. Anyway, uh, I'm a little bit late to this party and I, I like to let others post their thoughts and comments before I join in. And I tend to think about these things for a while as I'm running my CNC machine and watching it carve out guitar necks and bodies, I'm thinking about the world of uh, guitar building and trying to solve all the problems that you know that are out there. And what I have kind of concluded now, this is all speculation. You know, I'm not sitting in a boardroom at Gibson or a meeting room at Gibson and listening to them to the the senior staff discuss their strategies. So. I'm just speculating here. And it's based on kind of some of the things that I've heard and read about, you know, with this lawsuit and that video. But as you know, Gibson has new leadership at the company. They have a new CEO. And, and like I said, they brought in uh, Mark Agnesi from Norman's Rare Guitars. And there may be other changes that have occurred. You know, typically when you bring in a new CEO, there's a new team that's brought in because a new CEO usually means a slightly different direction or maybe a significantly different direction for the company, new ideas, new approaches. And that often requires new people who have experience in, in executing those type of ideas. And when I saw all this and took it all into consideration, it occurred to me that Gibson, like so many of the other big guitar makers out there, and in fact, this is like any, any company in existence, is looking for some new revenue streams. And when you look at the history of guitars, whether acoustic or electric, you could really call the period from about 1955 to about 1985 as the golden era for guitar manufacturers. During that time, and it sort of ramped up and then declined, um, you, the guitar manufacturers couldn't make guitars fast enough to satisfy the public's demand. And part of that's because of the baby boomers. But guitars became so popular in that time, you could go literally into any suburban neighborhood in America, and if there are teenagers living on that street, there were, there were guitars, and there were a lot of guitars, and they were just flying off the shelves, and it was a great time to be a guitar builder. But then I think with the advent of the personal computer in 1985 and the whole digital technology revolution that quickly followed, we saw the guitar sales start to decline, and suddenly teenagers had all sorts of other expensive items to consider. And they had to decide, you know, should I buy a guitar or do I want to buy a new computer? And of course, gaming systems, and then eventually smartphones and all that kind of stuff. It's just sort of pushed the guitar back as far as being a priority. And we're still selling guitars, obviously, but not 
quite the same rate that we were during that 30-year span from 1955 to 1985. And as a result, guitar companies are looking for new revenue streams. For example, Fender has Fender Play, which is their online uh, guitar instruction service. It's a subscription service, and that's that's probably a pretty decent revenue generator for them. I don't know, you know, the numbers behind it, and I'm not sure if Fender's even shared that. But I know that other guitar companies are exploring other ideas and ways to generate revenue, some of which have nothing to do with guitars. There, there may be some offshoots from it. Another good example is PRS. Uh, they've been uh, making some technologies that are uh, based on their guitar building experience, but they have nothing to do with guitar building. And it has to do with um, intelligence gathering and medical imaging. And what they've done is they've actually, I think, created a separate company uh, to do all that work in. But that's just uh, another example of how guitar companies are looking to uh, supplement their guitar sales income with other revenue streams. And I know there are other guitar companies which have made acquisitions of other companies in order to um, bolster their financial footing. And so I think what has happened at Gibson is that this, the new management came in and took a look at what Gibson has to offer. And one of the things they noticed is that perhaps their most valuable asset is their patents and their trademarks, copyrights, all that, you know, intellectual property, all that stuff. And they are now realizing that they could take advantage of that portfolio and create a new revenue stream. Now, what I'm talking about here is, is pure speculation on my part. So I could be completely off base, but it seems to make sense to me, at least. And I think that by filing the lawsuit against some of the other big guitar companies that are using their patents and trademarks without paying for them, Gibson would be establishing a precedent, especially if they can win. And that's totally going to depend upon the current legal team and the uh, legal atmosphere that exists and you know what's happened in the past you can't look at that because that was in the past and yes it does set a precedent to some extent but judges change lawyers change opinions change anyway it will set a new precedent and then what I think could come out of that and this is kind of based on the feeling I got watching um, Mark's Mark Agnesi's video um, a week or two ago and unfortunately, it's not there to watch again. And it, there are copies of it out there, but I'm not going to put those in my video. I don't want to. I don't want to mess around with this uh, copywriting and trademarking and all that kind of stuff. I have no reason to right now. Anyway, the feeling I got from it is that the lawsuit would kind of set a precedent, and then going forward, the way this would affect small shop luthiers like you and I, especially ones who build guitars to sell them, if you're using any of the patents or trademarks that Gibson owns without paying for them, and let's face it, none of us are, then you might, be, might find yourself in a situation where Gibson could come to you and request that you pay like a licensing fee. They could set up a licensing program so that small shop luthiers would pay a small fee every time they build and sell a guitar that uses their trademarks and patents. And this would be a fee that uh, would be incumbent upon us as the luthiers to build that fee into the price of our guitars. So, you know, the price of guitars would have to bump up a little bit. Or you'd have to stop using those trademarks, patents, and, you know, intellectual property that Gibson owns. That's just kind of a thought that I have. Now, Luthiers like you and I, small shop luthiers, one of the advantages that we provide the market is we can build pretty much anything. So if somebody out there wants like a Les Paul with a certain configuration or a certain finish or certain 
alterations that Gibson doesn't provide, they can come to the small shop luthier and that luthier can uh, accommodate them. And with um, the guitars they build that utilize the Gibson um, patents and trademarks, they're not getting anything for that when you build one of those guitars and sell it to somebody. And I think what Gibson is saying is, hey, we need a piece of that pie because those are, are essentially our guitars, even though they're made by somebody who's not an employee. They're using our ta uh, patents and trademarks. And I have to say, you know, when Gibson filed the lawsuit and then followed it up with that video and then pulled the video down, that probably did more damage than if they had left the video up because they, they could have used that as an op opportunity to make a follow-up video to kind of better explain what it is they're trying to do. Instead, they made the mistake of, of pulling the video and not commenting, and as a result, social media has been flooded with misinformation. In fact, my video that I'm making right now is pure speculation and could be construed as misinformation. Um, but until they come out and tell us exactly what it is they're uh, planning to do, this is going to be out there like that. And you're, there's going to be a lot of it and it's going to continue. And that's just going to um, kind of generate harder feelings by more people towards Gibson. One of the negative comments that I've uh, been seeing regularly on a consistent basis is that Gibson never really uh, made any efforts to protect their their intellectual property, their trademarks, or their copyrights and patents on a consistent basis. They did, you know, years ago in some of the lawsuits that they filed, but then that seemed to stop. And I've heard talk of, I don't know, I guess you would call them gentlemen's agreements between some of the guitar manufacturers and Gibson's prior management. But none of that really is going to matter when they, I mean, you can bring that up in a court case, but a judge is probably going to say, that doesn't really matter. What matters is what's happening now and what is in writing on paper. And those trademarks and patents are, they're, they're in writing. And, you know, you can't really argue uh, against their existence because they, they're, they're right there for everyone to see. So that's really what's going to matter the most. Anyway, those are kind of some thoughts I had about this topic, and I, I just wanted to mention it and because it does relate to the small shop luthier, and it, it, it could at some point down the road be something that we have to consider. Um, or I could be totally wrong. I don't know, but it was just, there was one line, one comment that Mark Agnesi made about, we're coming after you. And I got the sense from that, um, that Gibson is, is planning on some kind of future strategy that's going to involve collecting revenue from anyone who makes a a guitar that uses any of Gibson's trademarks, patents, copyrights. And also, um, I don't know if you'll remember, but, but shortly after uh, President Trump took office, he had a, a gathering of American manufacturers at the White House. And there were um, CEOs from a number of uh, prominent companies in the United States. Um, I think there was a truck manufacturer, you know, one of the big diesel truck manufacturers, Harley-Davidson. But the former CEO, Ed Gibson, was there. And I know that there was a lot of contention between Gibson and the prior Obama administration with regards to um, exotic tone woods and things like that. I don't know if you'll remember the FBI raid. Well, then Gibson meets with Trump, and who knows what they talked about, but I'll tell you, if I'm the CEO of Gibson and I have the president's ear, the one and only thing that I'm going to scream over and over is, 
trademark infringement by foreign companies. And we'll see if that's going to play a role in any of this. Um, as a small shop luthier based here in the United States, I certainly hope it does, but we'll see. So anyway, those are my thoughts. I hope this has been something that will give you some, some food for thought. Um, please, by all means, if you have any uh, opinions of your own and thoughts, share them in the comments below. Keep them clean. I always police that stuff, and so does YouTube. And, um, you know, if you don't already subscribe, click that subscribe button. Um, if you enjoy the video, click the like button. Um, click the bell that's right next to the subscribe button that notifies you every time I post a new video. And, you know, I'd been doing two videos a week, and I think I'm going to scale that back to one video a week. I find that I'm spending too much time with the video stuff when I would rather be out in the shop making guitars. So um, with that, um, I hope that you have a great weekend, a great week ahead, and I will see you in the next episode. Take care.